I find it extremely hard to give a conclusion to this Evergrande topic. The awful mess that Evergrande is going to face is pretty much clear. Number one, the undelivered housing projects and relevant liabilities, which account around 12% of the total debt. And number two, the panic from those wealth management product investors. Well, this one looks sensational, but actually less harmful. China has survived a social panic of a bunch of P2P bankruptcies in the previous years. So this Evergrande case, it's not the worst. And number three, the overseas debt. That's a real problem. But despite the uh, reputation damage, actually this part only accounts 1.2% of the total debt. In addition, it's purely market activity. Evergrande's offshore bond issuance interest rate is much higher than that of domestic ones, which already indicates the risk assessment upon Evergrande. Those global professional investors actually are completely aware of the risk they take. Let's look at what is happening to Evergrande recently. In January, Evergrande raised a proposal aiming to restructure its debt by the end of June. To repay some of its offshore debts, Evergrande is trying very hard to sell its Yunlong land parcel in Hong Kong, as well as its Evergrande Center commercial building. March 21st, Hong Kong Stock Exchange suspended the stock trading of Evergrande due to a 13.4 billion RMB deposits of one of the subsidiaries of Evergrande. That was never, ever disclosed. Right after that, Evergrande announced that the restructure of its debt would be ahead of schedule. So what does that mean? Evergrande's debt structure is indeed very complicated. It has been put under spotlight for seven months, but still there are secrets. This makes Evergrande more untrusty. Another point is that the quality of Evergrande's properties are being questioned. Previously, Oak Tree Capital, well known for managing stress debt, has taken over two projects of Evergrande. However, development of both lands are not satisfactory as expected. Well, we've seen news and rumors of SOEs acquiring Evergrande's assets and projects from here or there. I, I don't want to make prediction of whether or how Chinese government would bail out Evergrande. I think it's less important now. Starting from Evergrande's debt issue, the whole industry became so depressed. In January and February 2022, the growth rate of property sales has dropped to only minus 6.3%, while the growth rate of revenue has dropped to only minus 20%. For the first time in the past 15 years, we see negative growth of urban residents' mid- to long-term bank loan, which is basically house mortgage. In short, nobody is buying houses and nobody is borrowing money. The three red lines has already achieved its goal, I think, for houses are for living in and not for speculative investment. But it also suppressed the confidence of everyone. Evergrande's issue is a heavy blow, but if it has to go die, then it is what it is. To Evergrande itself, bankruptcy and reorganization are better than delaying and burning tens of billions of new energy vehicles. To banks, it's the best chance to review the relation between finance and real estate. To the industry, it's a wish for so long to put an end to this high leverage and high turnover model and back to a healthy operation. What we need to do now is to cut the tumor, survive, and keep going. Mass and pain are inevitable. On one hand, China has to figure out a way of genuine growth instead of fictional growth relying on real estate and raising debt. However, in recent years in China, such high-quality growth consisting of mailing consumption, exports, and business investment accounted barely half of GDP growth. The contradiction between rapid GDP growth and stable debt is almost impossible to resolve. We have to loosen the hook with purely pursuing GDP number. On the other hand, the relation between finance and the real economy needs to be redefined. 
rating system particularly would have to undergo a major repricing of credit and reallocation of credit risk portfolios. Banks could be very reluctant to lend to anyone before the new rating system settled. This would create disruptions of financial sectors, and I feel really sorry for healthy borrowers in the real economy. But I believe such cruelty is a necessary evil for bigger goodness. March the 16th, 2022, a statement was launched by China's Financial Stability and Development Committee under State Council. China's top economic policymaker Liu He has made three very important comments. Number one, China will continue to support overseas listing and keep the dialogue with U.S. regulators. Number two, China will complete the ratification work of large-scale platform companies as soon as possible. These two points both indicate those technology and digital companies that were cracked down since last year. And number three, he emphasized the need of proactive monetary policy and faster bank loan growth, as well as seeking stability of capital market. Right after that, the Ministry of Finance and CBIRC, which is the regulator of banking and insurance system, both have released very positive signals, basically encouraging the property tradings and also mergers and acquisitions of real estate companies. This is so good news that the market has waited for so long. It literally turned property developer stock price up for 20 to 30 percent. The new statement basically says that the policymakers are well aware of the market concerns and the policy stance will keep accommodative. The most important date of this year will be the 20th National People's Congress in October. This is when President Xi is expected to run the unprecedented third term of office. The priority ahead of this date is stability. Stability of everything. But the tricky point here is that when we talk about stability, we need something, some base to be stable, right? Without any economic growth or development, what kind of stability we're looking for? So for the new statement of Liu He, now I'm not sure if it's proactive or active or passive, or it's just a consequence under some pressure. Evergrande as a once extraordinary superstar finally stepped down from the historical stage. Even till today, I still think Evergrande was a great company, a company we should be proud of in a way. It facilitated the development of third and fourth tier cities that most people ignored. It created countless jobs in less developed areas, not to mention the contribution to the GDP growth. Any ambitious entrepreneur would be super sensitive with opportunities and do everything to expand their commercial empire. I see nothing wrong with that. Compared with those SOE developers who can always more easily get landing from banks, I would salute to Evergrande as a grassroots hero. The three high business model comes from the holy trinity of property development, debt, and GDP growth. If such model is a mistake, then Evergrande is both an accomplice and a victim. I hope this is the beginning of a real change, and good luck with Evergrande.